Welcome to Webinar Wednesday. We're excited about today's presentation featuring expert Eric Wickstrom, RTI Training Manager for Product Management and Customer Success. Eric will discuss the development of mammography units and how they have gone through a dramatic evolution with ever-increasing demands on image quality and reduced dosage. Webinar Wednesday would like to thank our sponsor, RTI Group. RTI is a world-leading manufacturer of quality assurance solutions. In 1981, they invented the first X-ray QA system for diagnostic radiology. Since then, innovation has been at the heart of their corporate philosophy, and they have pioneered many QA procedures. RTI continues to invest heavily in R&D to push forward the, to the very edge of X-ray QA across all modalities. For more information, please visit rtigroup.com. A few announcements before we get started. MD Expo strives to provide healthcare technology management professionals with a unique, intimate, and rewarding conference second to none. Please join us in Las Vegas on November 1st and 2nd for the 2021 MD Expo. Please visit mdexposhow.com for details, registration, and our steps to a safe and clean meeting environment. While you're there, please make sure to sign up for our newsletter so you'll always have the most up-to-date information on this event. Let's give one lucky attendee the opportunity, opportunity to win a newly designed Webinar Wednesday shirt by answering the following question. In what country is the RTI Group headquarters located? You can find the answer by visiting our sponsor's website. Please use the questions feature on the GoToWebinar dashboard to submit your answer. As always, today's webinar is eligible for one continuing education credit from the ACI. You can obtain your CE certificate by completing the post-webinar survey. More details on this at the end of today's webinar. We'll wrap up today with a live Q&A session. You can submit your questions at any time during the webinar by using the questions feature on the webinar dashboard. We'll get through as many attendee questions as time allows. As I mentioned earlier, our speaker today is Eric Wickstrom. Eric, you may begin whenever you are ready. Well, thank you, Jennifer. And also thank you to MD Publishing for this uh, opportunity to talk a little bit more about uh, QA and the X-ray field and mammography in, in particular. Um, I'd just like to start uh, with a brief recap of uh, where, we, where we're from, from the RTI group. As Jennifer said, we're now celebrating 40 years of X-ray safety and quality work. It started off in 1981 uh, in um, uh, as, a, as a result of a thesis project, actually, from a technical university uh, here in Gothenburg. And from there, being in the first non-invasive KV meter uh, onto the market, uh, we, we've uh, then launched into coverage uh, and uh, uh, across the whole uh, globe, basically. Um, it started off in 81, like I said, with a system called DigiX, uh, where we had a, a small uh, detector connected to a larger um, uh, computing device and also a, a, a laptop for uh, the re printing the result and presenting the result. Um, it took off quite well because the alternative was, of course, uh, working with a bleeder or a, a voltage divider. And of course, that uh, requires a lot of work, a lot of time and some, some uh, hassle to get the, the KV values out of a KV, uh, out of an X-ray. Uh, modality. So by simply placing this device in the beam, making one exposure, and that took maybe five minutes, uh, that was a big gain, of course. Uh, so working through there and advancing the, uh, the technology, we had more compact devices out there in, into the 1990s. Uh, I'm sure you've seen, may have seen some of these out on the market. PMX3, this unit here is quite popular. We still get that uh, return to us for calibrations. Uh, unfortunately, we're running out of spares, so repair is uh, not uh, that frequent anymore. 
Moving into the 2000s, uh, the, the new millennium, we uh, launched uh, uh, first to launch a multi-probe uh, system with the Barracuda. Uh, at, uh, it was launched at RSNA uh, with the Barracuda uh, and uh, was, was received quite well. Uh, today we have the uh, two main product families. One is the Piranha family here as a multimodality uh, instrument for KV and dose dose rate HVL total filtration, a multimeter for X-rays uh, for multimodalities. The uh, smaller family you have is a Cobia, that is the single modality uh, family, for, um, uh, but with a built-in display. So we have those two covered. The thing that keeps us together is the software, is Ocean software, which uh, is um, um, a way of, of collecting uh, in measurement data from uh, the different uh, tests that's being done onto the market to be able to build a database and present uh, the, the, the measurements made into uh, proper reports. The latest edition is, of course, a scatter probe that we've uh, introduced recently, uh, with which we we'll, you can measure scatter and leakage for all X-ray modalities. Uh, to make a complete uh, set of, of this and a complete test kit, we've got a number of probes, external probes, to be able to to uh, um, handle CT uh, measurements, CTDI, for instance, that measurements for the for the dental industry. And uh, that, and th those kind of things. Um, we're active, and our target market is uh, medical X-ray. Those are the applications uh, where uh, we have typical diagnostic imaging uh, applications. Uh, we also uh, look at the therapy side a little bit. It's for the KV components on the therapy units. Uh, onboard imaging devices, uh, CBCT simulators, or, or uh, uh, the, the, the pre-stage uh, targeting, uh, used for targeting uh, tumors and before they go into therapy. They are KV uh, range products, and even though the patient, patients uh, just as a, a few moments later will be exposed to much higher energies, the KV components in the therapy units need to be uh, quality tested as if they were diagnostic, since they are diagnostic uh, devices. Um, as we see here, we've got mammography as one of the uh, diagnostic uh, imaging uh, portions of medical x-ray, and that's what we will be talking about today. Um, when we look, took a, talk about x-ray QA, it um, uh, encompasses quite a lot of things. And um, one of those things is that um, uh, it's done to monitor the performance of an X-ray unit to ensure that we have proper radiation output, that the dosing doses and dose rates are within limits. Uh, KV uh, also uh, are so, uh, performed and uh, uh, with are within limits, as are the the MA, the, the tube current and the dosage. Uh, the radiation field size should also be within tolerance. And uh, for CT, uh, the beam width needs to be uh, where it should be as well. Uh, unwanted radiation as well, of course, leakage and scatter is something that we need to to take care of as well. And uh, also for um, uh, as part of the X-ray performance, is uh, to to be able to check image quality uh, through the use of phantom, various kinds of phantoms. Why are we doing this then? Well, there are a number of reasons for 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 QA and for quality assurance, and uh, the part of quality assurance which is quality quality control. It is to perform uh, monitor the performance so that we can catch deviations or, and uh, anomalies before they cause harm to patients or to, to staff uh, in, in a facility. Uh, and thereby it needs to be uh, performed regularly and according to a specific plan 
so that it's done in the same way every time so that it's reproducible. Um, of course, with the systematic QA program, uh, the, it, it could also bring uh, a, a path to improved image quality. Uh, and uh, that, in, in, in uh, turn, redu may reduce the radiation exposure to patients. I mean, if the, the image quality is uh, good in the first picture, th there's no need to make, uh, take, a, take another picture with another setting to get a good, good quality control. So the idea is to, to uh, um, achieve high image quality at the lowest possible dose uh, or exposure to, to patients. And that's one of the results if we perform this uh, QA in a systematic way. Uh, in normal X-ray, of course, this is, this is uh, quite important. Um, if it's in a CT environment, CT environment, CT patients uh, being subjected to CT scans or a normal X-ray for a broken uh, arm or whatever, uh, but that's for diagnostic. I mean, that's in case uh, there's, there's uh, when, when something is wrong and you need to to figure out what is wrong. Mammography is uh, slightly different in that it's a screening process. Uh, if in mammography, healthy patients are subjected to radiation in a mammography unit to screen for cancer. And thereby, it's a, it's a risk we're subjecting healthy patients to. And that makes it all the more important to be in control and of the exposures and reduce the risks to the absolute minimum when it comes to radiation uh, exposure. In this process, of course, also, if it's uh, done uh, the way it should be and done uh, systematically, we may reduce uh, patient discomfort as well, and uh, which I think is a, is a very important uh, point as well, so that we can, uh, so that we get a higher uptake on uh, the sc uh, screening process. Get more screening more people. Um, so if we then look at the mammography, what are we talking about? Well, this is mammography as most of us uh, envision it, but it uh, has taken a while to get us to this place. If we look back a little bit, the first uh, notices we know we see of um, uh, mammography is in 1913 where German physician Albert Solomon uh, found uh, breast cancer uh, tumors in uh, tissue removed through mastectomy. And uh, so he could actually find that and thereby prove that it could be, it could be traced. Before that, it was all, it was all uh, uh, made through other means. So that's the first report of, of uh, mammography uh, usage. Um, in 27, there's an Otto Kleinschmidt, another German, describes a technique for imaging the breast uh, and uh, being able to, to perform a mammography before uh, a mastectomy. So uh, as a part of a screening, uh, sort of, of, of uh, early screening uh, method. But still, it was only used diagnostically when there was uh, uh, when there was a suspicion that there was uh, uh, breast cancer. Uh, then we then diagnose it uh, and confirm through through uh, a radiography. Uh, in forty nine, in Uruguay, Raúl Leborn found a way of uh, uh, identifying microcalcifications. Uh, by compressing the breast. So that he's a, the, the, the inventor of breast compression and thereby improved the, the, the probability of, of identifying uh, early stages of breast cancer. Uh, and, and then we have one, Robert Egan. He combined all this with a vision of, um, of, of improving the, the image quality but also by um, 
uh, using uh, film, X-ray film, and the scatter grids uh, to standardize a screening process for mammography in the early 60s. Uh, so that's that's where we see the first uh, attempts or the first um, embryos of a, a mammography screening process. Um, if you look at the technology, well, first uh, we have the, the normal film X-ray, uh, the X-ray film, industrial X-ray films, uh, like we saw in, with with um, uh, Mr. Egan. Then in the late 60s and early 70s, serography was introduced, which is then getting the, the images onto paper, and that uh, reduced the radiation dose to the patient uh, significantly, especially compared with industrial grade X-ray film. Um, then, all through the 70s, the development of, of film, uh, we saw the advent of faster films that required lower doses. So the doses could go down even uh, even further. And uh, with uh, scatter grids, etc., we have a much better image quality. And after that, what we, we have other technologies uh, coming in, in um, full field digital mammography. Uh, with uh, with even less dosage, uh, we've got CESM, which is contrast enhanced spectral mammography. A tricky word, but that's uh, when you use um, contrast, uh, typically iodine isotopes, uh, to um, and and uh, um, spectral mammography, which is where, when you make two exposures in quick succession with two different energies. Uh, so then you can then you can see pick up differences between those two images and identify uh, in a, to a, to a larger extent if um, if there is any uh, cause for for suspicion. And now it's also we've got the uh, Tomo synthesis uh, units out on the market already uh, for uh, um, 3D. Uh, view of the breast. So we have then a possibility to, to see and identify even through uh, stratifications of, of the tissue, different tissue, uh, to, to uh, rebuild, uh, take a series of images and then rebuild to a 3D image and thereby uh, increase the, the possibilities of, of uh, identifying uh, risk for cancer. Uh, just to give you a picture of what it was like in those days to uh, be subjected to mammography, we see here to the to the left these are units from from uh, early uh, late 50s and early 60s. Same here, and here is a, a unit um, that was launched in 66, I think it, uh, I believe it was, by uh, CGR in France, Cenograph. Uh, CGI, CGR, which then later was purchased by GE. So that's what you see is the, the history of GE uh, uh, mammography. Uh, that's where that's where the unit uh, comes from. That's where the history is. So it doesn't look very very user friendly or patient friendly uh, in the early days. Uh, thankfully, it's moved a little bit forward, uh, even though it still can be uh, appear quite uh, daunting to to uh, visit a machine like this. But uh, things are moving uh, in the right direction, at least. Um, all right, so what else has been uh, uh, happening in the in this field? Well, for mammography, it started out with uh, normal radiography uh, uh, tubes, uh, and then they found with um, uh, lower uh, energies, uh, we could uh, is look at other target materials to uh, get a lower energy uh, spectrum of the photons uh, from the tube. And that would then impact, uh, have an impact and influence on the image quality. And I'm sure you, you know that from before, but the recap is that uh, with a higher KV, a higher energy of the photons gives us a higher penetration uh, through the body uh, or through the through the object, 
uh, even if you go really high, you can penetrate uh, to some extent even bone matter. So for a normal uh, radiography or a normal X-ray, of course, uh, high energy, higher KVs is to be uh, could be preferred in, in some cases. When it comes to to mammography uh, in breasts, we have very little bone uh, and uh, a very much soft tissue. So a lower KV is to be preferred because it will give us a higher contrast uh, in the image, and uh, thereby it will. Then, and that's what we would like to to have uh, when we're trying to identify very small differences in um, density for like micro calcifications or tumors or other uh, unwanted growths in the breast. So the lower KVs gives us a better view of, uh, of the, the breast tissue. Um, and then, of course, that's for targets uh, and the energies that they can produce, uh, the anode targets. Uh, with filters and the combination between target material, anode target, and the filter after the tube exit uh, gives us properties uh, that may uh, that we can vary for different purposes. So if we're looking at a typical uh, typical uh, combination here is moly moly, a classical uh, combination. Uh, well, we have a moly target spectrum, which looks like this, uh, something like this, where we have 2K uh, spikes or one uh, at, at uh, 17 and 20 to, uh, around around there um, and then it tapers off where we have the acceleration voltage up here the kvp up here if we place a filter on that made out of molly molly it will have a cutoff frequency determined by the k band uh, electrons uh, at about 20 kv so that means that we can filter away the higher energy uh, photons, uh, photons with a higher energy than 20 kV, giving us useful uh, photons lower than 20 kV, and uh, thereby improving the, the image quality or the contrast of the image uh, for that. Um, if we look at another combination, we've got moly rhodium, for instance. These are just two early examples with the rhodium filter we have we, we're moving the the cutoff uh, limit to uh, the cutoff kv to around 23 kv so we get a little bit higher energy energies uh, out of the tube and uh, to the target or to the to the subject uh, which gives us more it's higher kv thereby we have a higher penetrating uh, power um, slightly less contrast, but uh, we need may need the higher energy to penetrate uh, a more dense breast or a larger breast uh, to get uh, the photons through and into the detector. So that it, uh, if it doesn't penetrate properly, of course, it's no use to us. If it doesn't penetrate the the breast, it's, it's of no use to 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 us. This means that will have a, a difference then in energy uh, between the, the, this one compared to the moly filter, uh, even though the target is the same. So we have a slightly different uh, uh, area here or a KV range uh, that, we can, that we can use for different purposes, for different types of, of uh, in a, uh, measurements or, or imaging. Um, so that was from Molly Rhodium. If we uh, look at silver, we can combine that with other targets uh, as well, of course. But silver would have a cutoff uh, frequency of around 25.6 or 26 kV. So they would have slightly different uh, energies and a spe different pe spectrum to use for uh, when it comes to to. Uh, they might be useful for certain in certain cir circumstances. So this is then the combination, of the, an illustration of what different target filter combinations do. 
and of course there are an, a whole host of different target and filter combinations that we can choose from nowadays and uh, that manufacturers actually do because what we see here is from uh, the classical uh, target filter combinations we we saw from the, from the early days uh, molly molly uh, molly rhodium uh, and rhodi rhodium rhodium for instance we now see quite a few more uh, with tungsten targets tungsten rhodium tungsten aluminum even which is uh, a typical um, radiography uh, target filter combination, but also in use for um, for mammography for certain for certain applications. We see, of course, silver uh, filtering. Uh, we see copper filtering as well. So we have tungsten with a 0.3 millimeter copper, uh, which is which is quite interesting and which is heavily filtrated and. Is, is used for for special purposes then to to uh, to provide certain image qualities. And what does this do? Well, we see a growing no number of target filter combinations and the different combinations. Well, of course, that will then depend on what the manufacturer would like to uh, what the objectives are when it comes to finding uh, images. What, what kind of, of, uh, of um, um, images do they, uh, are, are they in search of uh, and in what circumstances? So that would, would guide the, the target filter combinations. Um, now, when it comes out then to a measurement point of view, uh, it's not only the target filter combinations uh, that matter, it's also actually the geometry uh, of the, the mammography gantry, the, the geometry of the X-ray machine or the mammo machine itself. So it could be the angle of uh, the tube uh, or the, the, the angle of the anode dish uh, uh, and the detector, the image detector. What angle is it at? How is it actually uh, mounted? That could impact the, the, the readings of the, of the KV and the dosage. Uh, the angle of the filter versus tube and versus detector. That, that also will impact the filtration and the filtration, of course, uh, impacts the, the spectrum. So those are, are things that, uh, that affect the, the MAMO spectrum, uh, some of the so two of them at least. Um, so how can we monitor this? Well, if it's uh, if we're looking at it uh, with the ion chamber uh, technology, the differences may not be all that big when it comes to to dosage. Uh, when we're looking at the solid state uh, equipment like uh, like RTI produce, um, it these are these are factors that do affect the the uh, the, the readings. So how do we do that then? Well, we try to we want to customize the the calibrations for the best performance. Uh, so in in this in these cases we we don't only uh, give it our best shot. We we'll actually verify it on units on site, uh, so that uh, so that it's uh, that that we are. Sure that we can be sure that we give the the proper reading uh, when it's when we're measuring it. Uh, that's also important because, as we'll see later on here, that uh, it's not only dose and HVL; it's also KV uh, is important for the, um, uh, the full range of calibrations that are available clinically. So that's that's important to, to be able to check all of the all of these. So that's that's what we see uh, from a, from a technical point of view then, and what we're what we're up against uh, when when we're talking about mammography. As for quality assurance and mammography, well, we have a number of standards, quality standards. Uh, one is uh, the, the MQSA in the US. Uh, which is uh, quite early in the 1992 uh, to 
implement the, uh, the maintenance then of high quality breast center screening programs. As since it was identified that it's a screening process, uh, we're subjecting healthy individuals to radiation uh, exposure and uh, that needs to be made as safe as possible. So then this was then uh, introduced. Uh, and that was in, in 94, it was uh, in the US, the first ra radiographic examination to be fully regulated by the fe federal government. So it's under, that, under the government's control, apparently since 1994. So and the ultimate goal then is like we, we said with all quality assurance programs is to reduce the risk uh, and improve the quality of service to individuals uh, and, to, um, and also support for those who are, who are willing to, to work in the direction of, of uh, uh, that service in the, in, in the community. So that's a, like a support for them. There are, of course, other uh, quality standards uh, when it comes to mammography. EUREF uh, is a European protocol. Uh, and we have another one, which is IAEA, which is the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, the branch for, for, uh, for uh, radiation um, and diagnostics. They also have a quality assurance program for digital mammography. And uh, these three, the, uh, uh, the one we look at is ACR, by the way, it's, it's also an American, American College of Radiology. Um, and these have uh, striking similarities. There are, of course, differences when it comes to it, since there are different uh, uh, geographies and, and different markets they act in, so they have different uh, uh, circumstances to operate within. So there are there are differences, but there are striking resemblances. And just for for this uh, presentation, we'll look at the ACR a little bit, for a few of them for the the ACR uh, quality control manual to see uh, get some examples there. Um, and I pulled out uh, the the out of the ACR digital mammography quality control manual the uh, tasks for medical physicists and uh, of course we do have other tasks for radiologists uh, and also for uh, radiography technicians uh, and they and that's also typical for the the other uh, for, for other quality control standards where you identify uh, um, um, a role within the, the organization and the corresponding responsibilities for that role and ensure that this covers the, the, the needs of the quality control program. Now for the medical physicist test, we'll run through them just a little bit and see what's, uh, what we have. Uh, ME, it says here in, the, in the, the, the item, the tests to be performed and also uh, MEE is mammography equipment evaluation, uh, which is done uh, before the installation and when there is a big change, if it's a tube or generator change or something that impacts the, the performance of the unit in, in, the, in the, a substantial way. Um, and if we just we'll just look through them a little bit just to give you any idea what's what's going on. Um, uh, mammography equipment evaluation, yeah, that uh, needs to be needs to be performed. That's a specific, quite a long test. Then you've got an ACR DM, which is Digital Mammography Phantom Image Quality Test, and um, that's done to ensure ensure the image acquisition that it's uh, giving the right images uh, in uh, every time for each exposure. Uh, and also then uh, there are ways to check signal to noise ratio and contrast and uh, uh, among other things. And it's, you, you, it's using a specific phantom uh, with uh, a certain setup that uh, looks something like this. Uh, there, there's an insert of, with uh, wax uh, and in there, there are fibers, there are small uh, spheres and uh, masses to uh, to um, 
illustrate uh, small calcifications, small tumors, and other uh, anomalies that might, that you need to be able to identify in in uh, during a scan. Um, there's a uh, digital breast uh, breast tomosynthesis Z resolution that's to ensure that it's no blurring in the Z direction. Uh, spatial resolution is then also done to see that way, that it's it's uh, resolving the, the the image in a in a proper way. That's also done with a with a tool with uh, line pairs, uh, and and, and the, taking an image of that. Uh, spatial resolution, uh, of course, is is the the that, that was spatial uh, spatial resolution. We've got the digital uh, breast tomosynthesis volume coverage to see that it's actually the the, the 3D scan uh, and covers the whole volume of the whole breast in this in this case then for a mammography to ensure that and that's done with a slab of PMMA and then uh, with um, uh, Aluminum sheets, one on top and one below the the the, the, the slab of PMMA, to be able, and see if the that the three D uh, exposure can actually uh, identify that. Expo uh, exposure control, of course, is important to to see that it works uh, properly, and that's also then done with the with the Phantom, uh, and. Um, then when it comes to average glandular dose or AGD, um, which is a standardized test uh, performed in one way with ECR, another for UREF and a third uh, way for, for IAEA. But the principle is the same. It's to trying to, to uh, measure and uh, determine the typical entrance uh, dose for an, the average patient depending on the breast thickness and, uh, and um, target filter combination used in that case. So well, we'll look a little bit closer on that because that's something that uh, we at RTI uh, are, are, can, can offer a solution to with, with our products. The other ones, uh, not, uh, not, not quite yet. Unit checklist is to make sure everything is proper, no cracks, everything is locked, no, uh, nothing falling off the machine. Uh, computed radio radiography, if it's ap applicable, we, it, it's to check uh, the, the image uh, and the, the uh, CR system to see if the plates uh, work as they should. Then we've got monitor Q quality control for the acquisition, for the radiologist, and also the site technologists. Uh, uh, no, sorry, the, those two, the monitor uh, quality control, just to make sure that the monitor uh, can provide the, the proper image quality. So there are then test images uh, recommended and uh, used to see if you if uh, they are, uh, the monitor works as advertised. Uh, Film printer uh, QC, well, if there is a film printer from a di digital, uh, that needs to be checked as well. And uh, to see that the, the film, uh, Im image on the film corresponds to the film on the, the, the monitor, of course. Um, site technologist quality, quality control program, yeah. And uh, the, the Device technologies quality control program. Well, the evaluation of that is an ongoing process. Uh, so that uh, to, to ensure that the quality control program uh, is uh, helpful in the large uh, scope of things. Manufacturer calibrations uh, also need to be taken into consideration. Uh, there are some, of course. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, maintenance, not repair, but uh, maintenance where the manufacturer may need to to calibrate the, the machine to ensure uh, proper uh, performance. And uh, that needs to be taken in, that needs to be made a note of every time the, the manufacturer is there for, for, for that kind of calibration. 
and the integral of course is for according to manufacturer recommendations what they what they, know, they know how often that is that, that is needed collimation assessment is to ensure and to see what what uh, how, how well the x-ray field and the light field align um, uh, quite um, straightforward and that's usually done with coins uh, today to see that you have uh, uh, how well that the light and the x-ray field co coincide then we've got two tests here which we'll also look uh, look at a little bit later it's the beam quality or the half LLA test uh, and the kvp accuracy and reproducibility test which are also tests with which uh, uh, for which we can uh, our tools can offer a solution um troubleshooting of ghost image evaluation yeah, to see if there is any ghost uh, ghosting on the on the detectors and uh, also of course if there is a film uh, the view box luminance how well uh, what that what that looks like so this is then the typical quality control program uh, or, or suggested uh, items on a, in a quality control manual uh, the technologist uh, the technician would have uh, another uh, range of of, uh, of jobs and uh, the radiologist, of course, others. But in this, I'm just focusing on, on the medical physicist test. So as you see, we've got quite a few with where we where we work with a phantom or with other test to, tools for image quality, line pair um, uh, test tools, and, and, and those kind of things, um, to be able to match and see and and verify what's what's going on, like we saw with the phantom. Now, for the measurement that where where our uh, instruments can can be used is uh, AGD, which is average glandular dose. Like we said, it's a, it's a way of assessing uh, typical exposure during a, a breast examination. And uh, there's a formula that is quite complex that we need to follow, and uh, that is then the, the input to that is done. By, by measuring dose at a certain point. And the sequence is then that it's uh, taken the, um, the the values, the set values are taken from um, a, a previous test um, where the AEC test uh, mode is done with a phantom in the field. Uh, those, that, those, that technique those technique parameters are then you know you save those and enter them in manual mode and uh, replicate that um, that exposure uh, as as closely as you can when it comes to the ma or uh, mass settings um, and makes make uh, exposures according to this uh, then this uh, formula where we measure the entrance exposure so it's the entrance exposure to the breast that is then uh, just underneath the the, the paddle, um, and this is then an, uh, an illustration from the side. We have the compression paddle and the, the, the dose uh, sensor, 4.2 centimeters above the image uh, receptor, centered in the beam, four centimeters from the chest wall. So that's the reference point where we want to measure the dose during the AGD, the average glandular dose verification. Um, doing this is, um, um, for, for that purpose, we have, for the piranha, we have a support of a certain height, it's, we call it the, the piranha mammo holder. The height of this is such that we, that the, reference uh, the detector surface uh, lands at 40 millimeters uh, from this uh, from the bottom of the uh, bottom of the uh, holder add two millimeters of uh, the, the lead shield that you typically use to to protect the detector and you arrive at the, the with the detectors at 42 millimeters or 4.2 centimeters uh, from the detector surface, uh, and of course the piranha. With the piranha, you measure dose, uh, and also at the same time HVL, so that can also be verified. So 
in this configuration, if we have the this configuration placed here uh, in, in that position, we could have the choice of running an, uh, an ocean template with the right parameters. Breast thickness, yes, 42 millimeters, that's a reference. Set KV depends then on what we had, the, the, the setting we had for, for um, the um, uh, exposure control, the AEC test, that technique that we had there. And these are then the, uh, the exposures that needs to be done to get the HVL value. That's the added filtration that you typically uh, slide in and put uh, aluminum sheets on top in, into, the, into the paddle. To create the HVL uh, sequence. And the Ocean software will then compute all this data and give us an HVL value and also calculate an AGD value according to this formula, which is done, then done in the background. Here. So we'll say we'll get the HVL value here and uh, also the AGD value there for that breast thickness. Uh, but since we do have the possibility of a one-shot quick HVL measurement, uh, just one exposure would suffice to give us um, um, an AGD value, since we get the HVL directly uh, from the exposure. Uh, and so one exposure gives, uh, gives us the AEG directly in this case. Uh, then there's a beam quality test uh, that should be performed to, to check the, the, that we have the proper beam quality and the right exposure parameters. And that's then done, recommended again like this, uh, with the, uh, the compression paddle uh, raised up so you can place aluminum sheets in there. Again, we do have uh, the possibility of using the piranha, and we can, in that, this case, place it directly onto the, the, the protective plate because distance is not a factor when we're measuring HVL for, for, for this. So if it's here or if it's four centimeters up, it doesn't matter. There's a backscatter uh, protection in the, this detector, uh, which uh, may, not, may not be the case for, for, for normal ion chambers, where they, which may be affected by backscatter. Uh, so this is then easy, just place it there and then uh, off you go and make your exposure to get the HVL. One shot, that's all that, that's required. Um, and according to the test, well, it, you need minimum one HVL uh, measurement for each target filter combination available in the unit or used in that clinical application. So, of course, if, it, if it's one exposure only, of course, that makes it a lot easier and a lot quicker. Uh, otherwise, you need to do three exposures or, or, or more for each HVL value uh, captured with the, the traditional method. Um, then the last uh, test for which we can offer uh, some, some uh, a smart solution is a KVP accuracy and reproducibility test. Uh, the ACR standard here then calls for three shots at uh, one uh, a typical uh, KV setting, uh, say it's 28, uh, and for that, that is a base stem for, for the reproducibility testing. And then there's two other exposures, where, and those are used for the KVP accuracy test. Uh, these can be combined in one template here, so we do five exposures and we get the, the two voltage accuracy measurement. So we get an accuracy here, the limit is plus minus 5%. Uh, we also, in the, in the same uh, uh, sequence, get the two voltage, the KV reproducibility with the coefficient of variation and the maximum deviation from mean uh, all, in, uh, all in one go. And those are, are things that, that uh, are required. So yeah, there are a couple of things that we can, we can offer uh, a, a smart, uh, simple solution for. Uh, 
and they're, they're quite important, but there are also, when it comes to quality assurance in mammography, a lot of uh, um, tests that require phantoms and other test tools. Uh, but it takes, uh, takes a lot of uh, different expertise to, uh, to provide good performance on a, on a mammography machine. So I thought I'd wrap it up there, there and uh, see if there are any questions or comments that uh, you may have. Um, Thank you so much, Eric, for your time today and for a great presentation. As a reminder to the audience, if you do have a question, please use the questions feature on your webinar dashboard to ask a question. We do have a few that have come in, and we'll start with those. The first question is, apart from ACR, EURES, and IAEA, are there other quality standards to use in use in the world? Uh, yeah, yes, there are. There are, of course, variants of it, and uh, that that they can choose a little bit from here and from there in different uh, countries and different geographies in the world. There is also, uh, in many places, unfortunately, a lack of quality uh, quality control um, in. Uh, where and that is typically maybe in countries that where screening hasn't come that far um, uh, breast cancer screening hasn't come that far so they're using it for a diagnostic and uh, these so, so that the, the impact may not be all that 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 great but uh, we see that we uh, that the interest and the use of uh, quality assurance standards is increasing uh, from our customers across the world, we get questions uh, all the time about those uh, that uh, phenomenon, and uh, we're we're quite happy to to help or any way we can to to uh, share information about these these phenomena. Thank you. Our next question is: How can you ensure that the specific calibrations in your instrument? include proper energy corrections? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's like I said earlier, there's, um, uh, we, we tailor the, the calibrations to uh, the target filter combinations that are, uh, that appear on the market. Uh, and to ensure that we, that we provide the right, uh, the right readings and the right output, uh, we work together with many of the manufacturers, or as many as we can, to to uh, identify that, so we can get a representative uh, uh, number of units uh, to test on at their facilities. So we're trying to do it side by side, uh, so that and verify together with the manufacturer that yes, this is the the the, the, the setting, this is the actual. Uh, dose or the actual KV or the actual HVL, what, is, what does the instrument say? And then if something is off, we adjust, go back, do it again so that we are sure that it's, it's always spot on uh, because this is important stuff. Thank you so much, Eric, for your time today and for a great presentation. I would like to encourage everyone in the audience to visit today's sponsor to learn more about the services they provide to our industry. Please visit rtigroup.com. A quick reminder that you can obtain your continuing education certificate by completing the post-webinar survey. The survey will be emailed to you one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your 1CE credit from the ACI, and you'll be able to download your certificate immediately upon completion of the survey. If you have any questions, please contact us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. We'll be back next week with another webinar. Please visit webinarwednesday.live for more details and for complimentary registration. Thank you all, and have a wonderful afternoon.